Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Has anyone holiday so far? <sighs> I'm tired, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a good one, but yeah, it's always a whirlwind. How about you? Has it been a good holiday? It's been okay. I've been busy, too. Just mm -hmm. kind of like, I enjoy it, but I'm ready for it to be over, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are your mom and dad doing? They're doing good. They got out and ran around at everything yesterday, and, um, but everybody's good. Dad keeps track of the Justin's kids, and mom is staying busy over there at Housing Authority. So. Yeah, it's different with her not being with the art show. I know. And so we, we helped them set up the other day, but that's even what I was thinking. It used to be, I guess it's made it this holiday a little bit easier, but because we yeah. used to stay busy yeah. all week long. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Put that in here. Well, Siona God, uh, hope you are having a good churchy holiday weekend so far. Uh, We'd like to welcome you to the Durban Filling Language Center uh, for the Cherokee Talks. Uh, we had a lot of good talks so far. We got another one to come up for you here. Uh, this is Feather Smith, and she'll be talking about ethnobotany today. Uh, Feather has been with Cherokee Nation since 2007. Uh, she worked as a tour guide in the Dilgua village at the Cherokee Heritage Center until 2015. Uh, she then served as a cultural biologist before becoming the current <laughs> ethnobiology manager with the Secretary of Natural Resources Office. As the uh, ethnobiology, ethnobiology manager, she oversees the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank and helps care for the Cherokee Nation Heirloom Garden and Native Plant Site. Uh, Feather has a Bachelor of Science in Fish and Wildlife Biology from Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So welcome to the stage, Ms. Feather Smith. What's on, bro? As Roy said, I'm Feather Smith. Clearly my laptop is gonna give us a minute here, so we'll wait a second to actually get into the PowerPoint. Uh, but I kind of, I went into school for fish and wildlife biology and it was a big emphasis on wildlife. Uh, my main interest was actually more in working with animals. Um, so I never expected to work with plants. Pat Gwynn, I don't know how many of you know him, but Pat was actually the person um, who was instrumental in getting the seed bank and the Cherokee Nation Heirloom Garden and Native Plant Site started. So I had had a, uh, one of my former Miss Cherokee coordinators had actually come to me and she'd said, Feather, there's this position opening up and it's going to be working and it's gonna be, need somebody with a biological background. And she said, I know that's what you went to school for, but we also need somebody who has a cultural background. And she said, we would really like to work with somebody that we know, so why don't you contact Pat? And surprisingly, at the time, I had never heard about the seed bank or the heirloom garden either. Uh, and so when I first approached Pat, I don't know if anybody in here knows Pat, but he's a character. And anybody who actually knows Pat is going to be shaking their head right now, agreeing with me that Pat is a character. Um, and so when I first approached Pat and told him about who had contacted me and how I was interested in the position, he kind of took one look at me, heard that I was a former Miss Cherokee, and went, I don't know if you can do this job, because uh, it's really, really labor intensive. Um, and eventually we talked for a few months and he ended up bringing me on um, and we were both kind of going, we don't know if this will work out. And for the first couple of years that I worked with him, the main thing that Pat loved to tell everybody is, one, this is the future Pat Gwynn, and two, she's really, really smart, but she knows nothing. And in a lot of ways, he was right, because when it came to plants, I knew nothing. I had no sort of a plant background. I had no sort of an agricultural background. Uh, I was specifically interested in wildlife, and I did have the, the Cherokee cultural background, so that kind of helped out. So I have learned ev almost everything uh, on the job since I started with Pat in 2015. So as Roy said, uh, the title of the presentation here is Ethnobiology, which refers to uh, the study of the environment and the way that Native people interact with their environment. Clearly, we're concerned with how Cherokees interact with their environment. So this says that no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch. We were an agricultural people, 
our gardens, when we could harvest, when we can plant, that influenced our entire life. It influenced our ceremonies, our religion. So it was very, very integral to our lifestyle. Uh, and I believe it was actually Redbird Smith that they believe first said this. And so it has become our favorite saying around the seed bank. And we always drive home the fact that no self-respecting Cherokee would ever be without a corn patch. So there's sort of two parts to this presentation. The first part of this, we're going to talk about the Cherokee Nation seed bank and our activities there. And then we'll kind of switch gears and talk about what the department does with some cultural forestry after that. So this is an aerial photo of the Cherokee Nation Heirloom Garden and Native Plant Site. Uh, I know I see some familiar faces here. Some people were out there with us yesterday and got to go on some of the garden tours. Um, and it's really, really neat whenever you get to go out to the garden and see it uh, in person, but it's also really neat to get to see it from the aerial views because one of the things that we did after we got the garden started, we had all of these important Cherokee plants out there, we were growing our heirloom crops, and then we started going, you know, we have to lay all of these new beds why don't we start laying our beds in culturally relevant shapes? So the vast majority of our beds are laid in uh, symbols and shapes that you would have seen in pre-European style Cherokee artwork, things that you would have seen in our pottery, our shell work, our baskets, uh, and then some of the designs are a little bit more modern as well. Uh, but it's really, really neat to get to go out and see not only the plants, but how we've kind of woven in the rest of the culture and the symbols in with that. So, the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank started, I believe, in 2006 was the first year that we decided to grow for the seed bank. So we would have had our first giveaway, I think, in about 2007. We kind of have a wide species variety for our seed bank. Cherokees were known for growing the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Really and truly, we're actually more known for growing corn and beans. The squash and the pumpkins, the cucurbits, they came along a little bit later. Uh, but then we also grow some other things like gourds, tobacco, and native plants as well. Now, one of the things that's really important to remember with this is, of course, we originally came from the southeastern part of the United States. We came from the Carolinas, the Virginias, Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. And in that area, we sat right in the midst of the eastern deciduous forest. Where we are now in Oklahoma, what was Indian Territory during removal, we sat just on the fringe of the eastern deciduous forest. So the climate here isn't too different, but it is hotter and warmer and more humid here in Oklahoma than it is back east. We also sit on the fringes of the cross timbers and the tall grass prairie. So a lot of the plants, the environment that we were really reliant on in the southeast, we luck out that there's a lot of overlap here. Uh, however, it's not the exact same. And that definitely means that for both our native plants that we're relying on, but also our heirloom crops, uh, that there's a little bit of a difference in the way that things grow here in Oklahoma than they did back in the East. So again, corn is one of our main uh, crops that we grow throughout the seed bank. We grow di four different varieties of corn. So what we have pictured here is the Cherokee yellow flower corn, colored flower corn, and white flower corn. All of our corn is either flower corns or we do have one dent corn. Um, so it's not going to be something like a sweet corn. When people call us and they want to order seeds for their gardens, everybody's, of course, always interested in sweet corns, which, which we all love. But what you have to remember about Cherokee crops is that what we were growing in the summertime, we were not going to consume in the summertime. We're eating that stuff in the winter when we, don't, we, we can't go out and forage for other foods. So we would allow the corn, the beans, to dry out on the stalk and on the vine, and then they need to be able to keep all winter long. So our corns tend to be pretty starchy. They're going to be best ground into cornmeal, made into hominy. You can eat these on the cob before they go into their milking stage, but the texture's going to be different. You know, they're a little bit tougher, they're starchier, uh, so that's something to keep in mind if you decide to try that. Now, our most unique variety of seed, and by far our oldest variety of seed, is the Cherokee White Eagle corn. Uh, Cherokee White Eagle, you'll see on the slide, the literature says this can get to be 8 to 10 feet tall. In reality, uh, here in Oklahoma, it likes our heat so much that it can get up to about 15 feet tall. Um, the cob is going to be red. And on a perfect cob, every single kernel is going to range from sort of a white-yellow color into a purple-blue color. And every purple or blue kernel is going to have that white eagle flying on the side of it. 
Now, this is not uh, the most edible of our corns. Our white eagle corn was our most sacred. It was our ceremonial corn. Um, but if you're really looking for something to make into good cornmeal or hominy, the flower corns are better for that. White eagle is gorgeous, though. Uh, we are growing this uh, this year on site at the garden. We're growing the Cherokee yellow flower corn. But we do also grow in some private residences, and so we're growing the white eagle corn this year. So we'll have this available next year through the seed bank giveaway. Now, we also do grow four varieties of beans. All of our beans are pole beans, so that means that they're going to need something to grow up. So when we're talking about that uh, three sisters method, we would have to plant the corn first. You would need to let that get a little bit of size, six inches up to about a foot tall, depending on how well it's growing. And then you would plant the beans around the base of it. If you plant those beans too soon and they start trying to crawl up that corn, of course, they're going to drag it right back down. So uh, you've got to have enough time for that corn to get a little bit of size and then be able to support the beans. We have the Cherokee Long Greasy, Trail of Tears, Black Turkey Gizzard Bean, and Brown Turkey Gizzard Beans. Beans are where we start having a little bit of trouble when it comes to growing these uh, within Oklahoma. In the southeast, they tend to do really well. The eastern band loves to brag about the fact that the beans are mostly a rust-free bean. That's not always true here. If we plant them too early in the spring when the temperatures are, stu are still too cool, we will have some problems with uh, rust. If we go ahead and we wait and plant them a little bit later, so most of the time we start planting beans late April, early May, we don't really have any rust issues and they like the warm temperatures. Um, all of our beans need, well, all of our crops need at least four inch soil temperatures of 65 degrees. So if you dig four inches down into the soil, that needs to be 65 degrees before any of them are gonna germinate. So they need warm temperatures. With that said, Beans do not like temperatures above 93 degrees. At that point, they stop pollinating. So you'll still have these beautiful bean plants, and they'll have beautiful flowers and everything on them, but we won't actually get any fruit. That's why, if you ever visit us out at the garden, you will see that we don't actually grow our corn and our beans together. It's because we have to plant our beans earlier in the spring to be able to get a spring, early summer crop, but our corn does not like cool temperatures at all, and it doesn't like a lot of rain. So generally, while we're planting this stuff in late April, early May, we're not actually able to plant our corn out there until late May, and some years it's been the middle of June before we can get it growing. This year, we actually got it in the ground in May, but it was very, very slow to really start growing and to take off, so it took longer than it normally does. Uh, so we actually haven't harvested the corn um, out of the garden yet. We still have some corn down there, which we're hoping to start harvesting next week. But what that means is that we can't quite plant those at the same time. Beans get planted earlier than corn, so there's no way that the corn's gonna be able to support those. One of the other things that we really look to do is to get a good bean fall crop, because most of the time, it just gets too hot in Oklahoma too early to really get a good bean crop in the summertime. If we can keep those plants alive all summer long and then wait until it starts to cool off in September, we'll get a really, really great fall crop, assuming that we don't get a frost too early that winds up actually killing them off, which is what happened to us last year. So kind of one of those things that anytime you're gardening, you never quite know what's gonna happen. Uh, now we do grow the Georgia Candy Roaster squash as well. This is by far our most popular seed, our most requested seed every single year. It is a very large winter squash, so these can get to be about 20 pounds. They can uh, be up to two feet long. It's a large squash. It's sweet. Any recipes calling for pumpkin, sweet potatoes, or squash, we can use the Georgia Candy Roaster for. And that's part of the reason why people love it so much. Once somebody's had it, uh, they, they generally they love to have more. They're always coming back for more. But we have some problems growing squash here in Oklahoma. It really doesn't like Oklahoma heat. So a couple of years ago, we knew we needed to get some more cucurbits into the garden, and we have a long vetting process before we start growing any seeds for the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank uh, on site. Because what we're really growing for is to preserve Cherokee genetics, heirloom genetics. And so finally, we've been hearing about the Cherokee tan pumpkin for years, uh, but we were just able to introduce it two years ago. We're growing Cherokee tan pumpkins this year, and they so far grow a lot easier than the squash does. We tend to have a lot of problems with the squash when it comes to heat and wilt, but the pumpkins have been just doing wonderfully. They do a great job taking over. If you've ever grown squash or pumpkins, you know that they'll take over a garden easily. They'll take over a large site. 
Cherokee tan pumpkins only tend to be about six to eight inches in diameter and total size, so they're a lot smaller than the squash, and they're actually sweeter than the squash. Uh, we like to use a lot of pumpkins in savory dishes, and we're finding that most of the time these are really almost too sweet to use in your savory dishes. It's going to really sweeten it up. They make great pumpkin pies. Now, we do grow gourds as well. Gourds are kind of funny in that they are technically native to what's considered to be Old World, so they're native to the Mediterranean region, they're native to Africa, but they predate all European contact in the Americas. They've been in the Americas for at least a millennia. They think that they actually were introduced into South America first and then traded up into North America. So we have been growing gourds for a very long time, even prior to European contact. What we have pictured here is the basket gourd. Uh, we also grow dipper gourds, which are sort of round at one end with a long handle growth, making them great for water dipping. And then we grow really small jewelry gourds, which would be used for decoration or almost kind of like a medicine pouch at times. The gourds, when that three sisters method, so we talked about corn and beans already and how they would grow together. The beans are actually going to crawl up the corn stalk. Beans also fix nitrogen in the soil. Corn likes to eat a lot of nitrogen. So those two things just naturally work well together. Squash, pumpkins, and gourds can all kind of be used the same way in that three sisters method. You're going to plant them further away from the corn and the beans, and then again, they do a great job of taking over the entire site. They have really large leaves that will completely cover the ground, and that coverage is going to cut down on the amount of weeds, and it's going to help out with moisture retention. So it kind of almost acts as a mulch. Now we do grow native tobacco as well, and we do give native tobacco through the seed bank. Native tobacco is about nine to 10 times stronger in nicotine content than that of smoking tobacco. So for most people, this is too strong to use for recreational purposes. Tobacco for us is ceremonial, it's sacred, it was medicinal, so it would really be considered taboo to use it recreationally. It's supposed to be used uh, for good reasons for ceremony. Now, with that said, we have a lot of people who always come to us, especially people who like to grow pollinator gardens or who grow crops, and they always say, you know, I've had a lot of interest, I've always heard that we should grow tobacco, is it even worth me trying if I'm not going to use it for ceremony? And the truth is, is that tobacco is a great attractor of pollinators. It also has some natural pesticide uses. Uh, so it's a great thing to have growing in a garden, but with, also remember that if you're, you're coming into contact with a lot of nicotine, so you may want to keep that away from small children, keep it away from your pets. Um, the tobacco, yeah, again, really is a great attractor for the bees, the butterflies, and hummingbirds love it. We get hummingbirds every year at the garden. We have them on site. We never see them, though, until our tobacco starts blooming. It doesn't matter the amount of flowers, the amount of plants that we have out there, specifically for hummingbirds. They do not show up until we have some nicotine for them. So they've all got a little bit of a nicotine addiction. Uh, I was actually just watching them fly around yesterday. And so kind of one of the things you really want to have that, you know, keep, keep that in mind if you're looking for something like a nice butterfly or hummingbird garden. Um, and it is, if you like to grow tomatoes, tomato hornworms are actually tobacco hornworms. So if you're growing tobacco, this is the host plant for the hornworms. They will usually leave your tomatoes alone. They'll be attracted to that tobacco, but they generally won't kill the plant because this is the host plant. So again, we kind of say it's a natural pesticide, but it attracts its own pest with that. You keep that in mind. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit tongue-tied today. It's been a long weekend. Now we grow a whole uh, bunch of native plants on site as well, and one of our favorites is sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes. So when you start going back and looking at the European accounts of Europeans who lived with Cherokees and the things that they noticed about our gardens, they all say, which we already knew through our own traditions, that our gardens, both outside gardens and kitchen gardens, were surrounded in hedges of sunflowers. And it took us a long time. We weren't really quite sure which sunflower was used because most of the sunflowers that we have here aren't really great for sunflower seed. Uh, sunchoke, or Jerusalem artichokes, is a sunflower. They tend to get to be about 8 to 10 feet tall. 
but what really makes these special is the tubers. One plant can produce up to five gallons of tubers, and the tubers can be eaten just like potatoes. They're not potatoes, uh, but you can fry them, mash them, boil them, any way that you would cook a potato. You can also eat them raw. They store their starch as inulin, so if you're not used to eating a lot of inulin, it's known to get the system going. It's always suggested that when you first try sunchokes, they're so tasty, if, especially if you love potatoes. A lot of people like to fill up on these, but it's suggested to kind of take it easy, especially if you're gonna have a hot date that night, because it's gonna get your system going. Um, we do give these out through the seed bank. We give them as seed. It's a little bit harder to start uh, from seeds. Sunchoke seeds have to be scarified, which actually means that you have to scratch the outer coating of the seed. And then they also have to be stratified, cold stratified. So they need to be introduced to cold temperatures generally for about a month or two. A lot of native plants are that way because they it actually go through the winter time and those really cold temperatures break their dormancy. So that way that they will sprout, they'll germinate in the springtime. So when you're getting seeds from the seed bank, that's something to keep in mind. Sunchoke is one of those that's a little bit tougher to start, uh, but it's very rewarding once you get it started from seed. It's also very weedy, so anywhere that you have some of these growing, they will take over a site, and that's another thing to keep in mind. If, if you don't want them completely uh, out competing everything in a bed, you might keep them away from that bed. Now, uh, the picture here at the bottom corner is actually a picture of a wild potato. So of course one of our clans is the wild potato clan. And what we consider to be a wild potato is technically a ground nut. Again, it's not actually in the potato family. And wild potatoes are still very important for us. Uh, they were still used for medicine, they are still used for food. But the actual, what we think of when we think of the wild potato uh, plant is this vine, and the vine doesn't produce a large amount of food. For, for one little plant, you're just going to get very, very tiny ground nuts. The sunchoke produces a much larger amount of food. So we do know that, of course, this was now the sunflower that we were using around the hedges of the gardens. But when you think about the wild potato clan, we always talk about it and we show the picture of the vine. And again, a very important plant for us. But when you start going back and translating the Cherokee, it can kind of translate and be talking about that vine, or sometimes a lot of people also call it the savanna or the prairie clan, and that's the reason for that, because wild potatoes, what we think of as that vine, would not have grown on the savanna. They need to be in moist areas. They're usually gonna be by the water, but sunchokes will grow in those drier prairie-type settings. So one of the things, one of the conversations that was really instrumental in getting the seed bank started is we had a citizen who had expressed an interest in having the Cherokee Nation represented and the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. If you're not familiar, familiar with that, it is a seed vault that's located in Norway, and the idea is that it's supposed to be kind of like Noah's Ark for seeds. They take seeds, uh, they will accept seeds from countries around the world, they put these into the vault, and the hope is, is that in the case of either a man-made disaster or a natural disaster, that vault and everything inside that vault is going to survive because they've done a lot of things to really make sure that it's, it's foolproof. Um, because we're a sovereign nation, they thought that the Cherokee Nation should be represented. But the seed that they were interested in was having the Cherokee purple tomato represented in the Svalbard seed vault. Now, at the team at the time, I wasn't working with them during this time, they had kind of already suspected because we don't really have any stories about this, but what we thought was that the tomato technically isn't a Cherokee seed. Tomatoes are native to the Americas, but mostly South America, the very tips of Central America. We did not have them this far north prior to European contact. The next thing is, is that the Cherokee purple tomato, we believe, was actually cultivated in the mid-1800s, and we believe that it got its name because of where it was cultivated at, which was originally in what would have been Cherokee homelands, but by that point, we had already been removed. So, of course, we still had Cherokees there, but the majority of the tribe had already been removed to Indian territory. So the Cherokee purple tomato is Cherokee in name only, like your Jeep Grand Cherokee is. Uh, it is not considered to be a true Cherokee seed. It's not something that we as a tribe cultivated. So then, after hearing this, it was actually a council who had come back at the time and said, well, if the purple tomato is not one of our seeds, what are our seeds and where are they? And when we got to looking for those seeds, we could not find any Cherokee seeds, at least not easily, here within the Cherokee Nation. 
And so then that became the mission was to go out and find Cherokee seeds. And so they started working with different entities. We did work with the Eastern Band of Cherokees. We worked with uh, some citizens within the nation. We worked with some corn experts. We worked with government entities until eventually we were able to find those initial nine Cherokee heirloom crops. And now we've got 10 with the Cherokee 10 pumpkin. Uh, after all of that, and that was what the seed bank uh, was started for, because what we found once we got a hold of all of these seeds is that nobody in the world were, was growing Cherokee seeds for the purpose of preserving the genetics of those Cherokee seeds. A lot of hobbyists were growing them. They were being grown in a lot of personal gardens, which is great. We still want that today, and that is necessary. But if we don't have somebody who's focused purely on genetics, those seeds, those plants are gonna change over time and they're at risk of being lost. So then that became the mission for Cherokee Nation was that we needed to get a hold of these seeds and start growing them for genetic preservation and get them back up to what they were supposed to look like, what they were supposed to be like. And after that point, our seed bank started and we all kind of completely forgot about Svalbard. Well then in 2018 or 2019, Svalbard reached out to us, and they actually approached us and said, we would like to go ahead. We've heard about, you know, uh, what the, the kind of being the inspiration for the seed bank, and we would like to have the Cherokee Nation represented here at the vault. Now, Svalbard doesn't just store seeds. They also do a lot of genetic testing and research on seeds as well. And for our way of thinking about these seeds, our heirloom crops are sacred. So we could not just allow anybody to be coming in, fiddling around with the genetics of these seeds, even with the best intentions. And we had to go back and we had to tell them that. On top of that, to be able to do that testing, they were going to require gallons of seed, which was gonna completely wipe out our seed bank for a couple of years. Um, and so we just, we went back to them and said, there's just no way that we can make this happen. And so they sat down and then they eventually came back to us and said, what if we just store the seeds and we don't do anything else with them? And that was something that we were really excited to do because we like to already keep our uh, genetic stock back and then we do keep an extra genetic stock back. But of course, all of that is stored not only here within the Cherokee Nation, but here within just Cherokee County alone. So we hope that nothing ever happens, but should anything ever happen that would wipe us off the map, our seeds would be gone as well. Having them stored at the Svalbard Global Seed Vault ensures enough separation that no matter what should happen, hopefully these seeds are gonna survive. And so we went ahead and agreed at that point that we would have them represented at Svalbard. The next issue that we actually ran into with them is that when it comes to labeling their seeds, of course, this is a, this is a scientific endeavor, so they have very, very specific ways of labeling anything that comes into their vault. And for us, that wasn't going to do because Anything that we have represented, anytime we send out our seeds, you will see that they are always listed with their true name first, and their true name is their Cherokee name. And they had never had, of course, another language represented, and so we kind of had to go do a little bit of a back and forth, and they eventually agreed that all of the labeling would be done in Cherokee first, and then would be done in the ways that they would normally go about doing that. So the picture here is Chief Hoskin and also the former Secretary of Natural Resources, he's now our Attorney General, Ch uh, Chad Harshaw, and they're both holding the packages that were getting ready to be sent over to Svalbard. I believe it was actually 2020, it was right before COVID, that we were able to get the seeds over there and they are getting ready to store those in the vault right there. At the time, I don't know if this is still true, we were the only Native American tribe represented within the uh, global seed vault. So the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank, we do accept seeds every year. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if not, any Cherokee citizen is eligible to request seeds. That can be citizens of the Cherokee Nation, the United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians, or the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. The idea when we started the seed bank was, well, again, it was genetic preservation. And what we realized is that for genetic preservation, for our heirloom stock, we really just need a small amount of seed. It, it is a, still a, a very good amount of seed, but we don't need gallons and gallons of seed. So once we get our genetic stock placed back each year, what we have left over is then what decided that we needed to give that back to the community. And these heirloom crops can't be owned by just any one person, any one entity. The tribal way of thinking is that what we had, these crops were owned by the tribe as a whole. And the tribe as a whole would be all three recognized bands of Cherokee Indians. So we send these out every single year for free. 
Generally, we try to open up the seed bank around February 1st. That can vary a little bit depending on how tech things are going. This year it was a little bit later, but we will never accept seed requests before February 1st. So it's either going to be February 1st or it's going to be after that date. Uh, we have started accepting seed requests through the Gaudugi portal. So that kind of helps uh, things out a little bit. If you've already got an account through the portal, you're not having to create a new account. And but the one thing to keep in mind is that seeds go very quickly. We grow as much as we can each year, but remember that we are the largest tribe, um, and that's especially once we start considering uh, including the other bands. We are a very, very large tribe. We can only produce about eight to 11,000 packages of seed each year, and that all is dependent on how the growing season goes. So we, we try our best, but we've gotten to the point where seeds are oftentimes gone within a day or two. They go very, very quickly. Now this says you will get snake bit, and that doesn't literally mean snake bit, though in gardening sometimes things do happen. Uh, but when we say you will get snake bit, what we're saying is that sometimes things just aren't going to quite work out. And so I already sort of touched on a little bit of this, but this is a picture of a nice healthy squash. At the bottom it says osta, this is good squash, this is what we want our squash to look like. But the first couple of years that we grew the Georgia Candy Roaster squash on site were wonderful bumper crop years. And then we've had problems with them ever since. And so I think it was the third or fourth year that they were growing, we started having issues where the plants were just dying literally in a day, throughout, in a matter of hours. And so the guys had gone out, the team had gone out and sat there and watched, and they were able to watch the plants go from healthy that morning to just dead by that afternoon. And that ruled out any sort of vandalism issues. Uh, it even kind of ruled out being a plant or a, a, an animal pest. And so um, it took a lot of research, and what we started figuring out was that it was wilt. So if you look at this picture, you can see that there's still one vine that has good leaves on it, but the rest of those vines, you see no leaves, and that's because the leaves had just kind of turned to slime and they're laying on the ground. So what we figured out is that the uh, cucumber beetle, which is those little green-looking ladybugs, they're technically not ladybugs, but they have spots like ladybugs, they carry a, a bacteria in their stomach, and any time that they feed on squash plants, they introduce that bacteria into that plant, and it causes some wilt in the plants. It, they do this with all uh, squash varieties, so your zucchinis or summer squashes, they'll experience, as, as, experience it as well, but it's usually not too bad. Every, a lot of the more modern varieties have a little bit of resistance to the wilt. Our squash had never been exposed to this bacteria before, and it was just detrimental to the health of the squash. And so it took us a little bit, but what we finally started using was a mixture of diatomaceous earth and eight dust, which is real similar to seven dust, but it's eight. Um, with those two things, we were able to knock down the number of cucumber beetles and squash bugs on the plants. And, <clears throat> excuse me, over the years, we've been able to get those plants to kind of build up a little bit of resistance to the wilt. Well, the next thing that we actually figured out is it wasn't necessarily the wilt alone that was killing the plants, it's also the heat. Again, our crops aren't used to this Oklahoma heat. And so once the temperatures start getting above about 93, 95 degrees, that will also cause them to wilt. And the combination of the bacterial wilt with that heat was really what was killing the plants. So we, start do, we started doing something that makes all gardeners just absolutely cringe when I say it, and we started watering during the middle of the day. Uh, we don't completely water, we don't water all the plants during the middle of the day, but we now have an irrigation system on just the spot where the heirloom crops alone grow. And when it starts getting above about 93, 95 degrees in the afternoon, around two o'clock, when the plants start to kind of look sad, we flip the water on for about 10 to 15 minutes and spray over top of the plants. And that cools the plants down. Fortunately, it really doesn't burn the squash plants because there are certain plants that you just absolutely cannot do that with. If you were to water them during the day and get those water droplets on top of those plants, the magnification from the sun on that water droplet will burn the plants and can sometimes kill or really harm the plant. Fortunately, we don't have too many uh, issues with that on our squash plants, but it really helps to cool them down. And so if you're sitting out there watching throughout the day, you'll come out in the morning, you'll see these beautiful plants. By about noon, they're starting to droop. And by about two o'clock, they're starting to look sad. At, at some years, they almost look dead at that point. We'll flip that water on. You'll see everything kind of perk back up for a little while, and then it'll start to droop again in about an hour or so. 
but it won't kill it. And then by that evening, once the sun has gone down, they'll cool off, they'll perk back up, and we just continue this cycle throughout the day. And between those two things, we've managed to get the squash, again, to kind of build up some resistance to that wilt, and we're also figuring out how to make them work out here in Oklahoma. And just to let you know, I know I have absolutely sat out there and argued with Pat Gwynn before. Uh, a couple years ago, we were growing squash, and I took one look at it, and it was almost one of those years that we'd had a lot of rain. It was kind of getting too wet out on the site. And, uh, but I took one look at the squash, and I said, I need to turn the water on. And he's like, Feather, you can't. It's too wet out here. And I said, if we don't turn the water on, these plants are going to die. And so we went back and forth. I eventually turned the water on, and he finally came to me about 15 minutes later and went, I think you made the right call. So sometimes it's just necessary. We've got to do what we've got to do. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to start talking about some cultural forestry. So my primary job is working with the Heirloom Garden and the Seed Bank. But aside from that, some of the things that we get to do in our ethnobotany department is that we get to learn a lot about cultural plants, cultural plant identification, and we oftentimes help our elders when they start wanting to find some of these plants or um, need some help with the plants. This is one of the things that we take pretty seriously in our job and we get to help out with. So something to remember about Cherokees is that we are a people of the eastern deciduous forest. But when you're thinking about the forest, what do you think of? Trees. We need trees to make up the forest. However, that eastern deciduous forest what, uh, site, that environment, creates this environment for all of these different plants that aren't trees. And for a lot of our purposes, it's the non-tree plants that are more important than even those trees are. But trees are necessary to create that environment. But that's a kind of one of those things, whenever we used to kind of work a lot more with certain entities, certain government entities. A lot of people have this idea that if we cut down the trees and then we replace those trees with other trees, something like pine trees, then we've replanted the forest and we have another forest out there. Technically, you have a forest out there, but it's a totally different forest. Pine forest, of course, change the pH of the soil. They change the way light filters through the trees. And all of the plants that we get in an eastern deciduous forest, you're not going to find in something like a pine forest. So now we'll see if I can get you guys to speak up a little bit. I'm going to test your uh, knowledge here on some plants. Can anybody say what this is? Cedar. This is eastern red cedar. Very important plant for us. We tend to use this to cleanse negative out of an area, cleanse bad out of an area. What is this? Jola tobacco. It looks a lot like it. It is not. It is not. I'll give you, this is a little bit of a trick for you guys because in truth, you're probably never going to find this in Oklahoma. This is American ginseng. So it's kind of, this is a plant that is so important to us and we all get to hear about the importance of these plants. And it's really funny because when we actually get to go onto a site where we get to see a ginseng plant, every person that we, I've ever been with, and even this includes me, the moment that we see a ginseng plant, we all kind of go, that's it? It's kind, of a, it's kind of a small, kind of a nondescript plant, and in this picture, it does look a lot like Virginia creeper. It looks a little bit different when you actually get to see it in person. Uh, what's really special about this plant, of course, is the root, and it's so important for us, but really doesn't grow here in Oklahoma. Uh, if you're ever drinking an energy drink, kind of look at the ingredients on that drink. It'll oftentimes list ginseng, not referring to American ginseng, but uh, uh, Asian ginseng, but that's kind of the way that we would use it, too. We would use it in teas, and it had a, a whole bunch of different uses medicinally, but that that was one of the ways that it helped out was by giving energy. Anyone know this one? This is golden seal. So ginseng likes to get fungus on its roots especially. Golden seal is antifungal. And so it will actually grow. You'll oftentimes see these two plants growing together, and it's because the golden seal protects that ginseng. Ginseng hunters, ginseng pickers, they're always out looking for golden seal first because they know they're going to spot this before they uh, spot the ginseng. And that kind of gives you an idea on how we use it medicinally because it is antifungal. It's a little bit of a hard picture to see. This is prairie willow. It is in the willow family. It's Salix humilis. We also call this red root because if you get a hold of the roots, it does have a very bright red root. Uh, prairie willow grows more as a shrub, and this is a plant that is so important for all of our southeastern tribes. We use it a lot in ceremony along with other medicinal uses. 
it has almost been over harvested, uh, picked out of existence here in Oklahoma. We've only got about two or three counties where it's still known to grow naturally. And so this is one of those that we do grow on site at the uh, uh, garden. And it does really, really well in those garden settings. We have some of the biggest prairie willow red root plants I've ever seen. So it really loves when it's managed and grows well in those settings. And that just kind of drives home how over harvested this plant is because it does not really have a hard time growing in most settings. Settings. This is New Jersey tea. This is also called red root, and it's a great reminder on why we don't really like to use common names. Uh, this is why scientific names were started, because common names often overlap. And again, it's called red root because it has a very, very bright red root. Uh, we always like to joke around that when we're out looking for a lot of plants, we always have people come up and they'll ask us, they say, we're looking for this plant, and the plant name is Delonagay. Of course, Delonagay is uh, kind of like yellow. And um, we're always laughing because you know how many plants that we get approached about looking for Delonagay, and then they're talking about five, six different plants. So most of the time, we need a little bit more information to be able to help people find their Delonagay. Uh, New Jersey tea actually gets its common name because when the Boston Tea Party occurred and all the tea was dumped into the harbor, the settlers here looking for an alternative to drink for their tea until they could get some more over from England started looking at what the native populations were drinking. And this is one of the plants that really took off because it has such good flavor. It makes a really good tea, uh, has a whole bunch of uses medicinally, um, kind of tends to be used for like headaches and upset stomachs and, and all kinds of things. Anyone know this one? Rattlesnake Master, yes. Uh, Rattlesnake Master gets its name. Well, the name kind of tells you what we use it for. We actually believe that snakes don't like this. They will stay away from this plant. We did use a portion of the plant to help treat snake bites. And this is one of the plants that our people, especially our warriors, were supposed to carry with them at all times. So seven is a sacred number for us. We have seven clans. We also have seven sacred plants. The preceding seven plants that we just saw are the seven sacred plants of the Cherokee. Now we'll go into some of those other plants. Anybody know this one? It is a flower, and it's actually in the Asteraceae family, which is the sunflower family. This is Sweet Everlasting. So Sweet Everlasting, we always hear, smells just like butterscotch. And I know Pat and I have been out in the field a lot of times looking for this or in areas where we just ran across it. And it took us a little while before we both came out and said it because a lot of people, if you tell them this, will get mad. Uh, but we both agree that almost every time that we've come across this in a natural setting, it smells more like sweet cat urine than butterscotch. Uh, we did transplant some of this into the garden years ago. We don't still have it out there. It didn't quite work out, but we had it for a few months. And during that time, for about the first two weeks after we transplanted into the garden, I could not go near that area because if you would get anywhere near the area, the smell was so strong I could not stand it. After about two weeks, it took a turn and it did smell just like butterscotch. So it may depend a little bit on how far along in its season it is. It's just pretty high in menthol and we tend to use this for congestion. Anybody know this one? Blood root, yes. Blood root is one of our favorite dyes. So if you dig this plant up and you get a hold of that root, it'll almost be like it's bled on your fingers and then it will stain your fingers a bright orange, red, orange, red color. We are known for our baskets. Cherokees were, some, were oftentimes considered to be some of the best basket weavers in the world. And the reason for that is we were weaving with split pieces of river cane. If you've never worked with river cane, river cane is hard to gather, it's hard to split, it's hard to weave, and it's hard to dye. There are very few things that will dye river cane and won't fade out over time, but blood root is one of those things. It also had medicinal uses, but that is the main claim to fame, especially today, is as a dye. Watercress. Now, fun fact, watercress is not native to North America. A lot of people think it is. We're really not quite sure when or who uh, introduced it. A lot of people believe that it actually got naturalized across the Americas when Lewis and Clark came over as they were kind of moving along that they were helping to spread it. But some people actually say that no, they think it was here before that and it might have actually been when the Vikings came over that they brought it with them. Um, either, either way, it has become naturalized across the continent at this point. It's very nutritious. You're going to find this in the water. We highly recommend if you're going to gather, harvest uh, watercress to 
pull it from waterways that are flowing. Make sure you really look around. Uh, you don't want to get into something that's going to have been exposed to any parasites and things. Go home, clean that up, because it is a very well known that a lot of people who get a hold of watercress will end up running into water flukes, which are not a fun experience. With that said, it is very, very nutritious, especially if you'll blanch it and do things like that and make sure it's nice and clean before you eat it. Kind of has a spicy flavor, so it's really common for salads, for sandwiches. Um, a lot of people love to harvest watercress. This is a tough picture to see. This isn't the best picture. Anybody know this one? This is high bush huckleberry. So huckleberries, of course, are great to eat. People love them. Uh, they can be very, very tough to pick. Uh, the huckleberries that we have here, we like to joke around that you can take your bucket out there, and you know when you drop your little uh, berries into your bucket, you'll hear that plunk sound. Well, two hours later, as you're sitting out there picking those berries, you'll still be hearing that plunk sound. So they take a long time to gather. Uh, fun fact, we do not truly, our huck, high bush huckleberries, our huckleberries here in Oklahoma are in what we call the vaccinium family, which is technically the blueberry family. So ours are really more closely related to blueberries. Uh, true huckleberries tend to grow up further north and west, but this is what we consider to be a huckleberry. Everybody know this one? Wild onions. Uh, of course, those green plants that we have come up in the springtime, wild onions, cochan, all of those first spring greens are kind of believed to be like blood purifiers. We sort of believe that after going all winter long without having any fresh foods, any green foods, those first greens that you had really got the system kind of going again. Echinacea, Echinacea purple coneflower, a great immune system booster. Green dragon, this is green dragon. They, uh, you know, I very rarely get to go out with a group and actually have somebody that can identify this one. Um, and I was not able to identify this before this job. So I worked out at the Cherokee Heritage Center before coming over into this position. And at the time I was in school for biology. And so one of the guys that I worked with comes in one day after they had been out gathering river cane and he had that red cone with him. And he says, Feather, what is this? And I look at him, I say, I have no clue. And he's like, well, you know, it smells pretty good, and I'm pretty sure that this is something that our ancestors would have ate. I want to try it. And I tell him, we do not eat things that we do not know what they are. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a recipe for disaster, and it's red, which is usually a good warning sign. We go back and forth because he's not convinced that he shouldn't eat it yet. And I think I eventually convince him, and we go about our day. A couple hours later, he comes back to me, and he goes, we really need to figure out what that plant was because I went ahead and I took a couple bites out of it and I'm not feeling so great. <laughs> so we pull out our phones and we get to Googling and we figure out that yes, it is green dragon and yes, green dragon is toxic. Fortunately, it is not one of two plants here in Oklahoma that just a small amount can kill you. Um, and what we actually run into with most toxic plants is that generally the flavor of them is pretty bad and you're probably not gonna eat enough to really hurt you. Green Dragon's not one of those plants. It tastes great. Everybody that I know that has tried this has all said it tastes wonderful and you could eat a lot of it. They also say it feels like either having razor blades or needles stabbed into your tongue over and over again. And then you're gonna spend the rest of the day very close to the bathroom because it's going to cleanse the system. That's the nicest way of putting it. Um, it's not a pretty experience, but it has a whole bunch of Cherokee medicinal uses. So we do uh, identify this one, and we do offer this through the Cherokee Nation Seed Bank, but that's one of the things that you want to remember. If you're going to grow green dragon, it's an important cultural plant. Don't eat it. Anyone know this one? This is a little bit of a trick. I'm trying to trick you guys here. What's this? This is thistle, scotch thistle. Basket flower, yes. Uh, so what do we use thistle for? Blowguns. Um, whenever we make our blowguns out of our river cane, the darts that are going to go through that blowgun have to have that white down on the ends of them, and that's what's going to push it through the tube whenever you blow on uh, the blowgun. The white fuzzy downy inside that we use today generally comes from thistle. Thistle, of course, is an invasive. We can find a lot of it. It's very easy, and they make great darts. But we did not always have thistle. What we had was American basket flower. American basket flower is a little bit more difficult to find. It does grow here, but it's not as easy to find as thistle does. It doesn't grow quite as long as thistle does. And the white fluffy inside isn't quite as abundant as what you would get in thistle. But they still make great darts. 
So let's start. What is the uh, uh, plant down here in this corner? Poison ivy, leaves of three, let it be. What's the plant in the upper corner? Virginia creeper. So for poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac, they have urushol oil in them, and it's the urushol oil that causes the allergic outbreak whenever you come into contact with it. Uh, Virginia creeper does not have urushol oil in it, and we only have poison ivy here in Oklahoma. We do not actually have poison oak or poison sumac unless you're dealing with a plant pot that has been introduced. Sometimes I hear people uh, being exposed to them around nurseries. So, Virginia creeper will actually leaf out before poison ivy will. In the springtime, you may come into contact with a Virginia creeper vine. You're seeing the Virginia creeper leaves, and you won't realize that there's also a poison ivy vine growing right there with it. Poison ivy does not have to have its leaves to still give you an allergic outbreak. You can come into contact with that vine at any point of the year, and if you have that urushol oil on it, which is still on that vine, you can still break out. So, people tend to confuse these two plants commonly. Now, if you'll look at the Cherokee on these plants, both of them are called Uludi. And Uludi kind of refers to the fact that it, it climbs on or it grows upon, referring to the fact that they're vines. If you look at our plant in the middle, it's called Uludi Nuwot. Does anybody know what Nuwot means? Medicine. And it is our word for medicine. So what we have in the center here is jewelweed, and jewelweed is medicine for poison ivy. It actually has a chemical that will bind to urushol oil, and it will make it inactive. Really what this is is if you know you've come into contact with poison ivy, you can get one of these jewelweed plants, crush it up, and clean it off. Because if you know you've come into contact with poison ivy, just washing it in water isn't usually going to clean that oil off. That's why they make all those special washes that you can buy at the drugstore, but jewelweed is a natural wash. Um, if you've already had an outbreak, let's say you've already been broke out and have a rash for a few days, more than likely your oil is already gone at that point and it has set in and this isn't going to do much. Some people say that it will cut down on the amount of time that you have that rash or that it will help out with the itching, uh, but it will not completely get rid of the rash. So I was uh, working out there at the, the garden one year, and we knew earlier in that year that we had come into contact with poison ivy underneath a rose bush. Um, earlier in that year, I'd actually gotten some on my wrist, and it was at a point where uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't leafed out. And I had the rash for a couple of weeks, but it was January, so it didn't itch quite as bad as it does in July. It did blister up. It eventually went away. I wasn't too concerned with it. Come that summer, we had thought that we had gotten all of the poison ivy moved out from underneath that bush, and I'm over there weed eating, and I wind up cutting underneath some large grass, and then sure enough, I see the poison ivy plant. I'm wearing jeans, I was wearing gloves, so I kind of hoped for the best, but that evening when I get home, I start feeling the itching coming on, and I flip on the light, and I look, and sure enough, this entire arm is covered, the whole top side is covered in red rash, the whole top side and bottom side of this was covered in red rash, and I had it going across my face and the side of my neck. Um, I immediately am looking at this going, I've got to get all of this cleaned off, and I was with an RN at the time, he took one look at it and was like, you're, this is going to be bad. You're going to have to go to the hospital. You're going to have to have steroid shots. This is going to be bad. And we had a bunch of plans, things we were supposed to do that weekend. And so I looked at him and said, take me to the garden. And it's the middle of the night. It's like 9, 10 o'clock, and he's sort of looking at me like I'm crazy. We get out there to the garden. I pull up one of these plants, use all parts of it because any part of the plant can be used, crush it up, and completely rub it everywhere that I can see the rash popping up. And the next day, it was completely gone. But again, at that point, what I'm doing is I'm getting all of that oil washed off. It hadn't really set in yet. Um, I had done it another time. Several years later, I came into contact after an argument with Pat Gwynn, who kept swearing to me that we did not have poison ivy underneath a certain plant. And I ended up getting the poison ivy come up on my wrist. Uh, again, it was before it was leafed out. And so I, you know, I, I waited too long. I really wasn't you know, too concerned about it because, again, it was early in the year. And um, when I did eventually use jewel weed on it, it seemed like I didn't have the poison ivy as long, but it definitely did not get rid of the itching, and it did not make it go away immediately. So uh, jewelweed is a great thing to use, though, to get that cleaned off. Now, does anybody know this one? 
sassafras. So this is another plant that when we talk about sassafras, we say leaves of three, but for a different reason, because sassafras ha usually has three distinct leaves on it. When you look at most trees, a lot of the leaves are pretty uniform, but a few of the trees actually have a case in where the leaves actually look pretty different, and sassafras is one of those. It has what we call just the sock or the football, which is a leaf with no lobes in it, it has a single lobed leaf that we refer to as a mitten that will just have that single lobe going through it. And then it has the double lobed leaf, which kind of looks like a turkey track or like a ghost uh, or like a glove. Now, if you're ever wondering, once you come into contact and you see those three distinct leaves, the next thing that you can do is take it and crush it up and smell one of those leaves. Most of the time, it'll kind of smell like root, or well, a lot of people say root beer. I kind of think they smell more like Fruit Loops, uh, but it has a very distinct scent to it, and it makes a very tasty tea. It is a, a known blood thinner, so it's recommended not to drink too much of this, to, to be very uh, careful with drinking sassafras, and it also has saffron oil in it, which is believed at this point to be a carcinogen. Now, it takes a very large amount of that before it's really believed to be an issue, but just things to keep in mind when using sassafras tea. It looks like chestnut. It's not chestnut. Chinkapin, uh, chinkapins. So this is actually Ozark chinkapins. So the chinkapin oak is named because the chinkapin oak leaves look like chinkapin tree leaves. Uh, but this is actually more closely related to the chestnut. So again, we were people of the Eastern Deciduous Forest, and at one time the Eastern Deciduous Forest was made up 40% of American chestnut trees. In the early 1900s, the chestnut blight was introduced into North America, and it has killed off 90% plus of American chestnut trees, to the point you almost never see them anymore. Chinkapins are so closely related to chestnuts that they're also affected. Ch uh, chestnut trees didn't quite come this far west. There were Allegheny chinkapins in the southeast where we were from, uh, but what we have here in Indian Territory, we're kind of on the fringes of Allegheny chinkapin, but more in Ozark chinkapin territory. But all closely related, all affected by that chestnut blight, and so it has killed off a lot of these. Um, but however, just like with chestnuts, it has, it's a great wood to use for like furniture making and carving, and it has a very nutritious, tasty nut on it that both wildlife and people love. I've had a lot of Cherokee elders just in the time that I've been in this job who have come to me and said, we used to get chinkapins all the time when we were younger, when I was kids, and we never find chinkapins anymore. What happened to the chinkapins? Well, that was what happened to the chinkapins. It was the chinkapin blight. Where they're working, there's some, some different organizations that are working to make more, um, to breed more blight resistant trees, but it's been a little bit of a back and forth. They're starting to have some success, but I don't know if we'll ever get to see chinkapins and chestnuts the way that we did uh, a couple hundred years ago. Common mullen. Mullen is another invasive. This is not something that's native here, but mullen has a whole host of medicinal uses. It tends to be used for arthritis medicine, teething babies. It can sometimes be used similarly to the way that we use tobacco. So it's a plant that we've basically adopted even though it was introduced. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and move from plants into mushrooms. What is this one? Wishy. Uh, outside of the Cherokee community, I believe they usually call this hen of the woods. Um, there's also a mushroom that's called hickory chicken, and sometimes people call this hickory chicken, but this is not true hickory chicken. Hickory chicken gets its name because it tastes and has a texture just like chicken. Wishy is kind of, it does have a very meaty texture. It's not as meaty as hickory chicken is. It's got great flavor though. Usually people who don't even care for mushrooms wind up loving wishy. And any Cherokee who knows where a good wishy crop is will not tell you where it is because they're gonna keep that all for themselves. Morels. Morels are one that we find in the spring, wishy we get in the fall. Uh, morels you'll oftentimes find in those kind of lowland areas. Uh, sycamore trees are really the most common tree to look for, but there's a couple others that you can look around the base of them for. Lion's mane, or in Cherokee, this actually this says uguku. Uh, we tend to call this owl's head. I've heard lion's mane. I've heard old man's beard. Got a little bit of a different texture to it. Uh, it's not too strong in flavor. So this is actually another really good mushroom. So 
all uh, plants that we would have found in the eastern deciduous forest. And when we can, we tend to introduce a lot of these native plants into our garden, which really acts as an educational site where we can uh, educate people on some Cherokee culture with these plants. But even working with native plants, you will get snake bit, just like working with heirloom crops. So one of the issues that uh, we kind of ran into, this was actually one of the first projects I got to work on when moving over into this position, is we had a prairie willow, remember we also call that red root, growing out in the garden. And we had our very first one, it had been out there for about a year at the time I started. And our elders came out and they looked at it, and I remember Pat being so happy to show it to them, and they said, oh, this is great, we love this, but you need to have two. This grows as a male and a female, and we use them both differently for medicinal purposes. And so we say, cool, what is ours? Nobody knows. And we say, how do we tell the difference between the two? Nobody knows. So we sat down and we started doing research, and we were able to find about four articles out of hours of research that actually talked about the phenotypical differences, what you could look at to tell the difference between a male and a female prairie willow. And what we figured out is that males bloom with red fluffy looking flowers, and females bloom with green kind of spiky looking flowers. So with that knowledge, what we're believing is that our plant is probably a male plant. And so we get out and we start looking, and remember, two counties here in Oklahoma that you can find these plants in. It's kind of a very difficult plant to find out in a natural setting. Uh, so we start going out and we start looking for big stands of prairie willows, because we can't just pull one or two plants from any, you know, one site. So we eventually find a pretty good clump of plants, and there's a bunch of males and one maybe female. So we can't pull her from that area because she's the only one. So we wait a few more weeks, keep looking, and they eventually, they went out one day when I wasn't available, um, and they come back with this plant and they said there was males and everything in between, and the whole site is just loaded, but I don't know what this is. And Pat asked me, he said, Feather, is this a female? And I looked at it and I said, I don't know what this is. And so he goes ahead and he sends us out again the following week, and we bring back another plant that we're about 80% sure is maybe a female. It's starting to get kind of late in the blooming season at this point, and that's the only time you can tell the difference is when they bloom for a couple of weeks. So then we have to wait until the following year. The following spring, our initial plant, our male bloomed as a male. The one that we brought back that was probably 80% a female blooms as a female. The one that we brought back in between that we weren't sure about we continued to be unsure about because it blooms with characteristics a little bit of both. Um, all we knew is that between the three, we had our bases covered, so we planted our male and our female next to each other. The other one got planted a little bit up the creek, and it actually grows better than the other two do. Um, and so we know that we've had a lot of success with those, and we're just happy to have our bases covered between the three of them. So one of the things that we do with those prairie willow plants is they grow so prolifically out there on the site that we have to prune them back every single winter. And when we prune them back, we take them, we stick them down in rooting compound, we stick them down into the ground, and we see if we can't start new plants or kind of clone new plants out of those prunings. And we've had some success with that. Some years we have like 80% success, some years we have like 10% success. But if we can start new plants, we will let those grow for about two years on the site, put down some good roots, and then we give those back out into the community to people who really need them for medicinal uses. And that helps to take some of the demand off of the native, the natural population, and it also kind of helps out the elders who have a tough time getting out and having to look for these plants on their own now. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're really excited to be able to do on site. So the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers is another group that we get to work with a lot, and it's kind of one of my favorite parts of the job is getting to work with the Medicine Keepers. They are a group of Cherokee elders who are all first language speakers who have a knowledge of Cherokee medicines, and they get together ever so often to try to continue and preserve that knowledge. This is their spiritual leader, Croslin Smith, and we really like to uh, point out Croslin uh, really likes to say that the purpose of this group was to um, expand the capacity for good. And he said, our capacity to do good is for all people, red, black, blue, and yellow. So it was really a group that was started to preserve that knowledge, but the hope is, is that we can take that knowledge of who we are and eventually share that with everybody because our environmental way of thinking is tied to our culture, it's tied to our society, and it's really something that if kind of everybody can follow that, they're gonna have a better relationship with the environment, and people who get there outside and get their hands in the dirt are usually tend to be a little bit of happier people. 
Now, one of the things that the medicine keepers wanted to do from the time that they got started is they wanted to be able to share that knowledge with the next generation. And so it took a few years before they finally figured out how to do that because sharing some of this knowledge can be kind of touchy. Some of this knowledge is very sensitive, um, and it's taboo to share it out too openly. And so they eventually did a pretty rigorous interviewing process. They were able to choose five students, most of them all in college aged, and um, started working with those students. They actually partnered them up with a medicine keeper, and they were learning language, they were learning about the plants, and they were also doing some community work uh, and working with Cherokee communities to help out with some of this knowledge as well. And there were a few of the students that had never done things like gathering wild onions, and we were able to get out and do that with them. We taught them about harvesting sunchokes. They got to learn how to make four bark tea. Uh, so there were a lot of really exciting things that we got to do with them um, and that the medicine keepers really, of course, headed on whenever they were doing that. All right, I think that is pretty much the end there. I had meant to get out of the symbology portion of this, uh, but if there are any questions, I'll go ahead and accept any questions now if anybody wants to ask any. So far, we sort of luck out in that where we're located, we do not have any problems with cross-pollination. Now, we cannot grow more than one variety of seed, so corn cross-pollinates, gourds cross-pollinate, squash cross-pollinates. We cannot grow more than one variety of corn on site each year. We don't grow one, more than one variety of squash on site, and we don't grow more than one variety of gourd on site. Uh, so that's how we avoid cross-pollination issues. It's just not worth it to try to sit there and really to, to there's ways that you can avoid it by planting this one earlier and planting this one later, um, but we just want to make sure that we don't even chance the integrity of those seeds. And so generally what we do if we want to grow more than one variety of corn in a year, for instance, we're growing Cherokee yellow flower corn on site at the garden, and then uh, a couple of our employees, if they have the space to do so and are willing to do so, will grow another variety at their homes. Um, sometimes we have other people that will help us out, but that that takes a very careful vetting process too because we have to make sure that they don't have anybody around them who's growing to avoid cross-pollination. So it's usually people who live in very rural areas um, who know their neighbors. Yes. It is definitely one of the issues that we have. So her question was asking if we ever have problems with soil depletion in our beds and in our areas. Yes, and so the job, we spend all summer long growing these plants, and a lot of people think our job gets easier in the winter, and it doesn't, because come winter time, we're ramping up for the seed bank, but we're also growing soil. We spend all winter long getting a hold of whatever organic material that we can, letting it break down on those sites. We're constantly putting mulch down and just letting that mulch break down on those sites. And then we uh, are fortunate, before when Pat was still with us, uh, Pat had a big population of goats and would bring us goat manure. Um, now we've got an employee who has a big population of uh, sheep and he's able to bring us sheep manure every year and so we get that manure back out on the site and that's what we use for fertilizer. So we spend all winter long growing soil. And it really, it's a poor site so we don't always talk about this but uh, initially, where the complex is located was the site of a government dump up until the 60s, 70s, and then at that point they cleared it up, cleaned it up, put new soil on top, and then turned it over to the tribe for our complex. Um, and so the soil out there is really kind of terrible soil, and if you start getting down too far, sometimes you run into some things. Um, so we're con you, what you have to kind of remember is that at the garden, nothing that's growing there wants to grow there. It's really a terrible site for that. Is there another question? Yes, a lot of people have. Uh, part of that, so uh, the, we don't have the issues that you would have with like something that you would buy at Lowe's. You know, there's certain plants that whenever you buy them and growing, grow them, you can't collect seeds from them because the seeds aren't going to be any good. So that shouldn't be an issue with our seeds. Um, all of the heirloom crops, if you're growing something like corn, for instance, you should be able to grow your corn. Now, well, one issue with corn is that what you're eating is also the seed. Uh, so you want to make sure that you put back a little bit, and we always say, Put back the best. Don't put back the worst looking corn. You eat the stuff that's not so pretty. 
You keep the stuff that looks great because that's what you really want to use for your genetics. But if you'll take that corn, let it dry out completely. Generally, it's, you know, take the cob, let it sit and dry for a little while. When it finally gets to the point that you can kind of rub that cob and the kernels start falling off, it should be ready. Knock all those kernels off that cob. Continue to let it dry for about another week or two because you don't want it to have any moisture on it. And then you can store it. Now, we generally store using a freezer. We have a pretty high-end freezer that really controls the amount of moisture and everything in the freezer. You can freeze at home, but you know most uh, freezers at home aren't. They, they do. You get a lot of ice buildup and things on those, and there's a lot of changes. If you're going to freeze at home, we generally suggest using like double containered. You know, put it in one container and then put it in another container because you really want to control the amount of moisture that's going to get into that. But aside from freezing, the other thing that you can do is just put them in an airtight container and then stick them back in a cupboard or back in a cabinet where they're not getting a lot of fluctuations in temperature, there's not a lot of fluctuation in humidity, where you're not really going to be messing with them too much. And they will usually, they can oftentimes keep for years that way. But um, in the freezer, they'll keep a little bit longer than they will in something like a cabinet. And then you can also do that with native plants as well. So that's true for native plants and that's true for your heirloom crops. Native plant seeds are just a little bit of a different beast to work with. So that's a good question. What are we actually doing with the food portion of the plant? Now, for the most part, when it comes to corn and beans, obviously the seed is the food. So um, well, it's not even a, a question on those because all of that's just going to turn into seed. But when it comes to pumpkins and squash and the gourds, which we're not eating, but gourds are also usable, what are we doing with those things? It really varies from year to year. So with the gourds, as much as we can, we try to just cut a hole in them and pull all of the seed out and then we have these leftover gourds and sometimes we get approached occasionally I'll have one of the schools reach out to me and say you guys have any gourds and I will send them to them um, if we have nobody else to take them the Cherokee Art Center is always really happy to take them and then they use them for classes and things that they teach uh, so we really like to make sure that they're not going to waste now the squash and the pumpkins that can vary. We've worked a lot with Kawi in the past. We've worked with Chef Nico Albert in the past. And we've also just gone around the Cherokee Nation complex going, well, anybody please take this stuff off of our hands? Uh, because we're always, you know, we can't really send too much of that out. There's a the time limit and we have to get the seeds out. So we have to cut everything open, pull those seeds out, and then we've got all this fruit sitting around the office. Uh, so we're always looking for somebody to come and get a hold of the fruit. And if you happen to be live here nearby or anything, whenever we're opening that up, we're we're happy to send it out to anybody we can send it out to. This year we're going to have Cherokee, well, we're hoping we're going to have Cherokee Tam pumpkins available. Any other questions? All right. Well, don't thank you all for coming out. I'm happy everybody was able to make it. I'll still be around if anybody has any questions after this, but thank you for having me today. Well, don't.